So in this next module, we're going to talk about writing with verbs. So this means using strong verbs, avoid turning verbs into nouns. We talked a lot about that as well last week. And not burying the main verb. That is, we want to keep the main verb of the sentence close to the subject of the sentence somewhere near the start of the sentence. So I'm going to go over each of these three principles in turn. So the first thing is we want to use strong verbs. Verbs are what drive the English language. Verbs make sentences go. They make the sentence lively. They draw the reader in. So verbs are the most important element of your sentence. So we really want to focus on verbs and focus on writing with verbs. So I'm going to give you a little example that sort of illustrates this point. So I took a sentence from a novel and I did a little editing on it to, to, to illustrate a point. So I changed a few words. So here's my rewrite of the sentence. It said, Loud music came from speakers embedded in the walls, and the entire arena moved as the hungry crowd got to its feet. And that's a perfectly fine sentence, right? It's pretty descriptive. It moves along. It draws the reader in. It's not bad. But I want you to compare that to the original version of this sentence. So this is the version from the novel itself. It says, loud music exploded from speakers embedded in the walls, and the entire arena shook as the hungry crowd leaped to its feet. And you can see how those really expressive, active, great verbs really just make that sentence so vivid. So by putting in those really great verbs, it really draws the reader and it really makes for a great sentence. It makes the sentence go. So I want to really encourage you to try wherever you can to put in really great verbs. That means you should always kind of pay attention and focus on picking the right verb. So sometimes there are instances where you could kind of pick any old verb. Try to find the absolute best verb. So here's an example. It's a perfectly fine sentence. It says, the WHO reports that approximately two-thirds of the world's diabetics are found in developing countries and estimates that the number of diabetics in these countries will double in the next 25 years. So we have two verbs in the sentence. We have reports and estimates, and they're perfectly fine, but we can do a little bit better by being really specific with our verbs. So what's another way to say reports approximately? Right? There's a verb out there that already has embedded in the verb that approximately. Remember I told you last week that we're going to try to avoid the use of adverbs. Well, one way to avoid adverbs is to pick the right verb that already has that adverb embedded in the verb. So what do you mean by reporting approximately? Another way to say that is estimates. So actually, that verb that they used in the second part of the sentence is perfect for the first part of the sentence. They're estimating. And of course, since we've uh, now used the verb estimates, we might want to come up with a better estimate for the second, a better verb for the second part of that sentence. And so if you think about what they're doing, they're estimating something in the future. Well, if you're estimating something in the future, a slightly better verb for that is to say projects. You see how much stronger that is? Because it gets that idea of the future in there. So these are just slightly better verbs that make a big difference to that sentence. So really pay attention to picking the right verbs. Use the thesaurus to help yourself find the absolute best verb that you can. And uh, when you want to use strong verbs, that means you want to use the to be verbs as purposefully and sparingly as you can. Of course, you can't avoid using is, are, was, were, be, been, and am. They're going to come up a lot. The problem is that in a lot of writing, it's like every sentence has a to be verb. This is that, that was this. You're going to see in a lot of the examples I give you, there's a lot of overuse of the to be verbs. They're very boring. you can, you got to use them sometimes. but. And every time that you use them, I'm going to ask you to go through your writing and underline all of your verbs and see how often you use the to be verbs. Uh, try to reduce the number of to be verbs that you're using. Sometimes you'll have to use them, but use it purposefully and sparingly and try to find alternate, better, stronger verbs to substitute for those to be verbs. Again, the to be verbs are is, are, was, were, be, been, and am. So really pay attention to using really good, strong verbs. A way to use really good, strong verbs is to take those kind of spunky verbs that we commonly turn into nouns and turn those nouns back into verbs. They're often really great verbs embedded in those nouns. But for some reason, as we talked about last week, in the academic writing, in the scientific literature, we've gotten in the habit, this terrible habit, of taking verbs and turning them into nouns. So we're totally writing with nouns. So I want you to try to turn those nouns back into verbs and catch yourself doing this. 
there's lots and lots of instances where we use nouns where they, we ought to use verbs. And this is just very, very common. You're going to see this in a lot of the examples that I go over. So here's an example sentence. It says, during DNA damage, recognition of protein 1 by protein 2 results in recruitment of protein 3 and repression of cell proliferation genes. So notice that we have a lot of nouns in this sentence, right? We've got recognition, recruitment, and repression. Those are all nouns that could have been verbs. Recognize, recruit, and repress. And we saw this also with a lot of the examples last week as well. So we want to go ahead and turn some of those nouns back into verbs. And when you do that, it's actually going to force you to get rid of some ambiguities that often crop up when you write with a lot of nouns. So if you notice in that first sentence, it's actually kind of ambiguous. It's a little bit hard to picture out exactly what's going on in terms of the biology. So, you know, it says recognition of this protein by the other protein. So what do you mean exactly by that? What does recognition of two proteins mean? And then it says results in recruitment. It, does that mean it's an indirect recruitment? Is there another step in there, right? There's all of this ambiguity of exactly what's happening. And in fact, when I sat down to edit this sentence, this is for a, a student I was editing her work, I actually had to go back to her and ask her, well, you know, what protein is acting on what protein exactly? What are the sequence of events here? Can, you know, I need you to draw me a picture because I couldn't tell from that first sentence. I, I couldn't edit it accurately because I didn't have all the information. That first sentence is really ambiguous. So I edited this with her uh, approval and help into uh, during DNA damage, protein 1 recruits protein 2 and protein 3, which together repress cell proliferation genes. So you can see now we're writing with verbs. That sentence is a lot more active. It's easier to get a picture, a concrete picture in your head of what's going on. I could now draw a picture of this. Um, that sentence just moves along so much more nicely. And I know specifically exactly what's happening uh, in that sequence of events. So it forces you to actually be very specific and really nail down what's going on. It forces you to say exactly who does what to whom in terms of the proteins. So watch out for this in your own writing. Try to get rid of some of these nouns and turn everything back into verbs. And there's just lots of examples of this. So here's a whole bunch of instances that we often see in this type of writing. Uh, you'll see things like obtain estimates of, has seen an expansion in, provides a methodologic emphasis, take an assessment of. Right? Interestingly, all of those are examples where we had a nice spunky verb estimates, expands, emphasizes, assesses, and for some reason, don't ask me why this happens, but for some reason we started to take these nice funky verbs and turn them into these really boring clunky nouns. Estimate, expansion, an emphasis, an assessment, and then not only do we do that, but we then pair this kind of boring noun with a really boring verb. Obtain, has seen, provides, take. So you want to turn all of those back into the just nice, direct, spunky verb. So you would say, estimate has expanded, emphasizes methodology, and assess. We don't need all of those extra words. We can drop all of those extra words and get right to the verb. Here's some more examples of this that crop up all the time in the scientific literature. So people will say it provides a review of, it offers confirmation of, it make a decision, shows a peak, provide a description of. Right, again, these are all nice spunky verbs that have been turned into nouns. Review, confer confirmation, decision, peak, and description. And then paired with a really boring verb, provide, offer, make, show, provide. So let's turn those all back into those nice spunky verbs. So that would be review, confirm, decide, peaks, and describe. See how much better that is? So the final point to keep in mind in terms of writing with verbs is that you don't want to bury the main verb. So what I mean by that is you want to make sure that the main verb of the sentence, which we call the predicate, is up close to the subject near the start of the sentence. And the reason is that the readers are waiting for the verb. So once you give the reader the subject, the reader is actually sitting there waiting for the verb. And the reader is going to get lost if there's a lot of material between the subject and the verb. They're simply waiting for the verb, and until they get there, they're going to be lost. So if you put too much stuff there, you're going to lose your reader. So I'll give you an example of this. I call this the case of the buried predicate. 
So here's a sentence that's pretty difficult to read, okay? So it, I'm just going to go through it. It says, one study of 930 adults with MS receiving care in one of two managed care settings or in a fee-for-service setting found that only two-thirds of those needing to contact a neurologist for an MS-related problem in the prior six months had done so. So notice how hard that sentence is to get through when I'm reading it. What's the subject of that sentence? Well, that's the one study. What's the main verb of that sentence? That's the found. So notice we get this really, really long subject. We get the study and then all this descriptive material, blah, 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 and then finally we get to found. Well, by the time you get to found, you've lost your reader. Your reader doesn't know where you're going with this. So that's really hard for the reader to read. And actually, this sentence has a really, really simple fix. All you need to do is move that verb up. So that one little change, you're going to just move that word found up and then put all of that descriptive material within commas will actually make this sentence a lot easier to read. Uh, and that's the only edit uh, I needed to make here to make this a lot easier to read. There's more edits you could, of course, do to this sentence. But here's what I did to it. So here's the predicate, found. So I'm going to just move that word found up. So we could just say, one study found that of 930 adults with MS who were receiving care in one of two managed care settings or in a fee-for-service setting, only two-thirds of those needing to contact a neurologist had done so. So notice that for the reader, as the reader is not bothered by all of that descriptive stuff as long as the reader's already got the verb. So it's not so bothersome to say one study found that and have all of this other stuff set off in commas. Your reader is okay with that. Your reader can follow that. So you've got to keep that verb close to the subject near the start of the sentence. I'm going to show you some more examples uh, of when authors put a lot of distance between their subject and their main verb. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.